Thank you and good evening. I'm so happy that you're here. I'm, I'm honored to be here and uh, I'm so excited to uh, talk to you about my favorite, favorite subject, uh, the pancreas. <laughs> and uh, people really don't think about the pancreas as far as being a gatekeeper to poor health or good health. Um, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a registered nurse. I also have my master's degree in social work, and I'm a certified health counselor. And my background is um, I worked in the OR. I've worked in critical care, med surge, dialysis. I ran two studies at Northwestern University Medical School, the aspirin myocardial infarction study, which was a winner. And that's why people take aspirin to prevent a second stroke or heart attack. And um, the study, uh, Stilfosterol study, which was a bust. And Stilfosterol was a drug that was used for breast and prostate cancer patients. And it didn't prevent metastases. What it did was prevent the bones from becoming brittle. Because with breast and prostate cancer, the first place that you, know, you have problems is with the bones. And they fracture. You could have a spontaneous fracture. So Stilfosterol was something that was used in water softeners and they thought that we'd keep the bones porous. So that was a bust. Um, but anyway, I um, also was um, a founding member and the first executive director of Gildas Club in Chicago. And right now, I also chair medical initiatives for Chicago's Sister City International Program. And we have 28 uh, Sister City relationships, so I travel a lot internationally. Um, I'm also, you saw when Val held the book up, the author of The Pancreatic Oath, and that book um, uh, is really, it highlights a program that I developed about 10 years ago called the Pancreatic Nutritional Program. So, but most importantly, I'm the mother of four grown children, three daughters and a son. And um, the essence of the Pancreatic Oath, my book, is the practice of self-help. You are your primary caregiver, and your physician is your secondary caregiver. You have a responsibility to heal yourself, in, ad in addition to whatever medication you're receiving. And I think a lot of people forget that whenever they have um, a catastroph catastrophic illness or um, even a minor, a flu bug or whatever, they really don't take on the responsibility. They leave it on the shoulders of their physician. So um, the hypotheses of the pancreatic nutritional program is that the pancreas, as I said before, is the gatekeeper of good health or poor health. And that if you abuse your pancreas, you open up yourself to the new buzzword now, which is NCDs, non-communicable diseases. Um, that's heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, heart attack, stroke, metabolic syndrome, polycystic ovarian syndrome, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. And um, when you protect your pancreas, you protect your health. And hopefully, after our conversation this evening, you'll understand the role that the pancreas plays in your overall health, weight, and well being. I want to ask a question How many of you have been on a diet? No. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have been on many diets? Uh -huh. All right. And um, how many of you would consider yourself to be overweight or you'd like to lose some weight? Okay. And how many of you are on medication other than treatment for cancer? Can you tell me what you're on? High blood pressure. Synthroid. Okay. I have like severe, mom, severe dramatic. I have acid reflux. Okay. So I have to take like Prilosec or Prophesec or something. Okay. Yeah, glucosamine and uh, Allotech. Anybody else? I think enzymes. Enzymes and uh, that's for, I don't know, that's for having surgery. Okay. For the digestive system. I've got high sour, I've got uh, diabetic drugs. Oh, you do? You have diabetic drugs. What are you taking? Uh, I take uh, Novolog and Lovinger. Okay. Because I've also got pancreatic cancer, so it's... Oh, you have pancreatic cancer? Right, so ah, okay. Okay. Well, this is, this is going to give you a lot of information. Um, 
there are actually right now 17,000 different diets out there. So on any given day, one in three women are dieting and one in four men are dieting. Um, it's always a yo-yo. And I think that, um, you know, people forget that their health really depends on what they put in their mouth. And people are always thinking about um, weight loss, but never, it's always about the pounds, but not about healing within. The pounds are a bonus, but what you really want to do is give your body the proper tools to heal itself from the inside out. And so um, I would like just for a moment to talk to you about the pancreas. The pancreas is little known until you have pancreatic cancer or you are diagnosed with diabetes. But if you take your right hand and you touch your thumb to your baby finger and put your three fingers like this and put your hand right here under your sternum, this is where your pancreas lies right behind your stomach. And this is where it attaches to your small intestines and that's where digestion becomes interesting. When you put a piece of food in your mouth, let's just take, for example, a piece of pizza. The pancreas wears two hats, an endocrine hat and an exocrine hat, and I'll go back to that in a minute. But when I was talking before about putting food in your mouth, when you take a piece of pizza and you start to chew it, that's the beginning of digestion. Your saliva contains amylase, and that starts to break down the food besides your chewing. You swallow, it goes down into your esophagus, into your stomach, it's churned up a lot of gastric juices, and then it goes into your small intestines. And when I was talking about endocrine and exocrine hat, okay, the exocrine hat is that the pancreas will make digestive um, enzymes. One of them is bicarb, and it puts that into the small intestines. Why? Because you've got this really acidic, you know, gastric juices that if that went into the small intestines, it would blow a hole into your small intestines. So the bicarbonate with it, you know, with the exocrine, it's released so that it buffers those juices that go into your small intestines. The endocrine hat is that the pancreas produces two hormones, well others, but we're talking about the two major ones, insulin and glucagon. Glucagon actually will stimulate your body to release glycogen into your bloodstream, release it from your muscles and your liver, okay, for instant energy that you need. Like let's say if you haven't eaten in a while, you were on a plane, you didn't get the proper meal, whatever, or you're, you're running a marathon, you need that extra burst of energy, your body will release that, okay? Interesting, when we talk about pancreatic abuse, pancreatic abuse is any time you raise your blood sugar over 100 after 90 minutes after you eat a meal, okay? So when I go back to the stored, remember I said stored energy, stored glucose in your muscles or in your liver? Your muscles can hold that for a long time, your liver can't, and when it releases it, it releases it in the form of triglycerides. So you can see the connection between heart problems and the pancreas. So now we'll talk about insulin. When insulin is released into your bloodstream, it ha it's released in order to bring down your blood sugar, okay? So every time you eat, you eat food and that's converted into fuel, i.e. glucose, to you know, operate your body. So when you raise your blood sugar, your poor pancreas has to pump in order to bring down that blood sugar. So it makes a lot of insulin. It's not a dance where you come with the date and it pairs up perfectly. So a lot of times you'll have too much insulin. And that's why when people get, after they eat a meal like let's say Chinese food and they get um, hungry an hour later, it's because that was the wrong fuel. It raised your blood sugar, your, pancreas had to pump like crazy, you bring it down and it drops and you become hypoglycemic and you get hungry and you've got to stuff something else in your mouth, okay? So what happens is, is that when you raise your blood sugar and your poor pancreas has to pump in order to bring that down, 
you create, as I said, it's not a dance where everybody comes with a date, you create a situation in your body with hyperinsulinemia. It's incredibly inflammatory. It causes and creates havoc throughout your body. Um, with the glucose and the insulin, um, the other connection with heart disease is that you've got this inflammatory stuff going on through your veins and your arteries, and what happens is it'll cause an irritation, an inflammation, and you will get like a little um, plaque that'll form. Just like if you cut yourself and you have a scab, that forms on the inside of your vessel. And then you eat the wrong fats, and it will catch on there, and it gets narrow. And that's where you start to have high blood pressure. Okay, it's just like stepping on a hose, and then your heart's pumping harder in order to get that through. Okay, God forbid something breaks off, you have a stroke, a heart attack. Okay, so that is, you know, trying to give you an example of that connection between pancreatic abuse and heart disease, stroke. And also, when I talk about inflammatory response, you have problems with your kidneys and all, uh, because of all the you know, vascular system running through your kidneys with filtration. Now, insulin, I want to go get back to insulin again. What insulin does is that it responds to an increase in blood sugar. Your pancreas produces more insulin. Insulin acts as a key that unlocks your cell door to allow the energy that you took in, food, converted into glucose, to enter that cell, to repair it, fuel it so it operates, create new cells. When you're eating too much of a good thing, insulin, no matter how much your pancreas pumps out, cannot open this door. And the cell is like, so what happens to that excess energy? It gets stored here, here, here. You get metabolic syndrome. It gets stored in your liver, and it creates havoc throughout your body. When we talk about pancreatic cancer, it's so important in particular to keep the pancreas in idle mode. Because if you're getting a chemotherapeutic agent, if you're getting radiation, does it make sense if you are forcing this sick puppy, your pancreas, to pump? you know, and have to deal with all this. It's just not fair. So the goal is to keep the pancreas in idle mode, to keep your blood sugar between 70 and 100. You never want it to go below 70. Some people can handle 65. Below 65, no, because, you know, you can faint, whatever. But you want to keep your blood sugar like this, which keeps your pancreas in idle mode that doesn't have to work. You never have cravings. And weight loss is when you're taking in the right fuel, pancreas isn't stressed, you walk a little bit more, you do some housework, you get on a treadmill or whatever, your body has to go into the storage tanks. That's weight loss. You're cleaning out the storage tanks. Weight gain is taking in the wrong fuel for your machine, which is your body. Um, let me go back to my notes <laughs> so I can just... And I know it's a lot to take in, but... Um, so, when you get a diagnosis of cancer, and how many of you have been diagnosed with cancer? Are you family members here? Or have, Not my family member, yes. You're a family <laughs> member. Um, can you tell me what, do you mind telling me what your diagnosis? Stage 3 Hodgkin's. Okay. And pancreatic cancer. You have pancreatic cancer? Um, I don't have cancer. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to just say um, one thing about cancer cells. There are two things that cancer cells absolutely adore, glucose and insulin. So every single time you raise your blood sugar, and then you force your pancreas to produce insulin, you create a petri dish for growing cancer cells. So it doesn't make sense that if you're getting chemotherapy, if you're getting radiation, that your poor body is dealing with all of that, plus the disease, and then you're putting fuel 
into your body that is stoking this fire of cancer. And this is all the new research that's coming out that is linking this to cancer. So um, you have to ask yourself, just like, what if? What if eating healthier, pancreatic-friendly foods made your treatment more effective or made a remission last longer? And I think that that is what you're going to be seeing. According to the National Cancer Institute, 80% of all cancers are due to identified factors and thus are preventable. 30% of cancers are tobacco-related. And as much as 35 to 50% of all cancers are directly related to foods. So, you can do something about your health, and I think that's the good news. Foods have had a significant impact on your health. Highly processed foods, animal protein, dairy, and sugar contribute to an unhealthy state for anyone's body. And Dr. T. Colin Campbell, the author of the China study, found that he could turn on and turn off a cancer cell in mice in a mouse just by changing the amount of animal protein that he ate. So that's when we talk about animal protein being um, a powerful cancer promoter. Dairy products, milk, cheese, yogurt, boost the amount of insulin-like growth factor, which we call IG, IGF-1, in the blood. In turn, IGF-1 promotes cancer cell growth. A small amount is normally in the bloodstream, but several recent studies have linked increased IGF-1 to levels in prostate cancer, cancer and breast cancer as well. Milk does other mischief. Its load of calcium depletes the body's vitamin B, which in turn may add to a cancer risk. Most dairy products are also high in fat, which affects the activity of sex hormones that play a major role in cancer. Also, high levels of animal protein can deplete cancer, I mean, uh, calcium levels as well. And it would come as no surprise that milk might affect the growth of cancer cells. And why do I say that? Because its biological purpose is to support rapid growth in all parts of a calf's body. After the age of weaning, calves, like all mammals, have no need for milk at all. Therefore, humans, after weaning, really have no need for milk at all. You can get your calcium through kale and you know dark leafy greens. Um, researchers are also investigating whether dairy products might be the culprit in other diseases, ovarian cancer in particular, is linked to galactose, a sugar produced from the milk sugar lactose. Yogurt cheese, lactose-free milk, and other dairy products contain sub substantial amounts of galactose. And an article published in Integrative Cancer in 2003 by Dr. D.B. Boyd cites that the role of insulin and IGF-1 are important growth factors that enhance tumor cell proliferation. The chronic inflammatory state may contribute to tumor progression. Growing links between insulin and the etiology as well as prognosis in colon, prostate, pancreatic, and particularly breast cancer are of great concern. Another interesting point in, in that article was that there's evidence that elevated IGF-1 may interfere actually with your cancer therapy, adversely affecting the prognosis. And I, you know, that just gives me chills. You know, you, know, you go for uh, treatment, um, you put your hands uh, in the care of a physician, but he or she is not responsible. You have a responsibility in your own health and well-being. So the Department of Biological Chemistry at Johns Hopkins University, their school of medicine in 1995, stated that growing cancer cells have a propensity to suck up glucose at high rates. Even the New York Times reported in 2010 that cancer cells, because of their rapid growth, have a ferocious appetite for glucose. All of this is nothing new. This was actually documented in 1923 by a German biochemist, Dr. Otto Warburg. He's the one that noted that normal cells, they were mm, about glucose, but cancer cells, love it. Pharmaceutical companies that provided medication to jam the accelerators that caused tumor growth 
are now focusing their efforts on drugs that block the fuel line for tumors, i.e. glucose and insulin. Once again, the patient is out of the equation. No personal responsibility for their health and well-being and no accountability. And I think that that has to change. I think that each and every one of us, whether you have to lose weight, whether you want to get off Lipitor, if you have high blood pressure, certainly if you have cancer, you have got to change the way you eat. You've got to eat for good health. You've got to give your body the right tools in order for it to operate at its optimum, optimum level. So how to change that? How do you begin with your diet? Well, you begin with what you put in your mouth. Um, one of my professors actually said that um, it's easier to get somebody to change their religion than to get them to change their diet. <laughs> I think that's true. So, um, you know, most doctors, God bless them, uh, will say to their patients, you know what you need to do? You need to diet, you need to exercise. And then the patient walks out of the office and they don't even know where to begin. They have no clue. Because it's easier said than done. And I personally don't like the word diet because it has the word diet in it. And every time someone hears diet, they're like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. So, but I, I really stress eating correctly, whether for weight loss or improved health, and that it is all about a lifestyle change. You have to make a commitment to your body by offering it the proper fuel, i.e. wholesome, nutritious, responsibly grown, pancreatic friendly foods. Now how do you figure out what is pancreatic friendly? Well there's um, a foundation with um, uh, some guidelines, but you have to test yourself, just like a diabetic would, for 8 to 12 weeks, 90 minutes after you eat, in order for your body to tell you what it can and cannot handle. Um, because we, our DNA is all different, the way we react to foods is different. I had, um, I had a client that came to see me. He was, um, he walked in the door, he was six foot two, he was like this, marathon runner, and I thought, what is he doing here? And, and I said to him, um, how did you get my name and number, and why are you here? And he said, well, look at my lab work. And he, dropped it on my desk, and I looked at it, and his triglycerides were 1,000. Wow. So you know the normal is less than 150. And I said to him, oh my goodness. And I, so he started journaling what he was eating every day. And if I were a dietitian, I would look at it and say, this guy is incredibly healthy. He's eating oatmeal with raisins uh, for breakfast. He's having pasta for dinner. All of it was like poison for him it would raise his blood sugar to 146, 176, whatever. And he was running, so he's running off the calories, but he was poisoning his, his body internally. So we had to change everything. So you, you test yourself 90 minutes after you have breakfast, after lunch, after dinner, and your body will tell you what it can and cannot handle. So as an example, um, I can't have whole wheat pasta, I can have brown rice pasta. Um, I don't tell any of my clients to count calories or count carbs because I don't believe in any of that. Um, most of my patients are unable to exercise because they are compromised with their health. They come and see me and many of them are very, very sick. But the good news is that, the, as I said before, that the body has the ability to heal itself. And to see somebody at the age of 71 to come in and see me who has, uh, who's on Lipitor for over 15 years and high blood pressure medication and needs to lose 75 pounds, and then they're 63 pounds down and off of those two medications and metformin for type 2 diabetes, that says a lot about the body. So um, there are, um, if you're not ready to commit to the pancreatic nutritional uh, program lifestyle outlined in my book, you can make a few changes that are, I think, very worthwhile and can have a tremendous impact on your health. One, you eliminate dairy. And when 
and by eliminating dairy, I'd also suggest that you eliminate anything white, white flour, potatoes, rice, um, and reduce your consumption of animal protein, that's beef, pork, chicken, turkey. Eliminate sugars, real and artificial. Your body reacts to artificial sugar just as if it's real. So Diet Coke and unhealthy. It's poison, absolute poison for you. And then the other is practicing proper food combining. Proper uh, food combining actually was started in the 1950s by a Canadian physician. So you would never have, um, let's say, uh, fish with rice or a potato. So that protein is always with a veggie and a salad, you know. So, and if you're going to have like brown rice pasta, it would never be with a meat sauce. It would be with a veggie sauce. It would either be pesto, eggplant, regular marinara, whatever, and a salad and a veggie. Um, so, um, and in closing, because I want to open it up to questions, I would like to encourage you to take your health and well-being seriously. You're in a partnership with your physician, and that partnership means that you have to do 50% of the work. It's not a, a physician, it's not fair to expect a physician to wave a magic wand and heal you while you sit back and you do not participate in your health. Your body is a living miracle. Your lungs never forget to take a breath. Your heart never stops beating. Your, no computer compares to the human brain. It has the ability, I can't stress it enough, the ability to heal itself if given the proper tools. You have to give the body something to work with. And expecting it to deal with all of this that you are throwing at it is is sinful. So give your, give your body something to work with. And the rewards, I, I, I truly believe, and I've witnessed it now in the 10 years, is worth it. And I would hope that uh, tomorrow would be the beginning of the practice of self-health for all of you. And uh, so I, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer any, if I can. <laughs> You said, uh, test yourself after 90 minutes when you have any. How do you do the I'm going to show you. I just need my glucometer that's in my purse. And so the glucometers are, um, they're not expensive. That's just like a, a printer. You know, you can get these for $19.99 to $24. Um, the expense is in the um, strips, just like the ink cartridge. But the good news is that you're just going to use this for 8 to 12 weeks until you get your own roadmap of what your body can and cannot handle. Um, and then after that, you know what you can eat. I know that, I mean, I travel a lot, like I say, I, I've told you internationally. Um, uh, I can go into any restaurant and know exactly what I'm going to eat. I know exactly how my body's going to respond to that. And I, when I have clients and they'll say to me, oh, you know, Saturday night I cheated. I cheated. I was really bad. And I said, no, no, when you use that word cheat, that's from somebody that diets. If you want to tell me that you abused your pancreas on Saturday night, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but that, oh, I can handle. But no, you're not cheating you're abusing your pancreas. And when you abuse your pancreas, you abuse your body. So I don't really advocate any glucometer. However, this lifestyle glucometer seems to be easier for most of my clients. So it comes in this regular size, and then it comes in the freestyle light, which is half the size. And um, I'll just do a quick demonstration. Um, she could teach me how to do it if she needed to. I know that's a stupid question, but like. It's so easy. I'm scared around needles, which sounds ridiculous. Wait, well, actually, you know what? I hear that from so many of my clients, and then afterwards, after they do it once or twice, they're so fascinated 
about how food, how they react to it, that they can't wait. So I carry, you know, the alcohol, you know, swipes, so I just will wipe that, but I make sure that it's, you know, not um, dripping with alcohol. This is the Lancet, you know, device, and this is the Lancet, this is the needle. These are very inexpensive. And you just put it in here, and you twist off the top, and you put this like this. I have it set at two. There's a dial here, and the number's here. It's set at two. But in the summer, when I'm doing a lot of yard work, I'll set it at four because I get like calluses on my hands. This, and this won't be accurate because we just, Laura and I went for dinner, <laughs> so it's not 90 minutes. But anyway, um, and this is the strip. And you place it right here, and it'll set, and then it'll show you that it's, it's ready to take the blood. You see how it's waiting for that? And then I just, I just go like this, press it like that. It's nothing, you can't even feel it. And then I just have this little bit of blood, and I put it right on this, and then it registers. It's 127. That's not accurate because it's not 90 minutes after. So you will always spike, but it's only 90 minutes after where you know. If this stayed at one, if this stayed at 127, then you would know for sure that what I had was absolutely abusive to my pancreas. Um, and what the level should be between bet between 70 and 100. The other thing that I want to say is that you know I can't. I I want to stress the when I speak about the partnership with your physician, that's critical. Because if you're on high blood pressure medication, um, any sort of medication, as your body starts to heal itself, your need for medication is going to be less. So let's say as an example, if you're on high blood pressure medication and now you're changing your diet and you're eating healthier, your blood pressure is going to get lower and lower. You know, and with medication, that enhances that. So you want to taper that. So you have to let your physician know that you are, have changed your lifestyle and that you're eating for good health. Uh, if you're diabetic and you need to take the insulin, is it that the insulin feeds the cancer? That's, that's the problem. You know, when you are, no one knows exactly how much, whether you're a type 2 diabetic or a type 1 diabetic, you can't accurately measure the function of the pancreas. So is your pancreas operating at 50% functioning? You don't really know. So it's putting out, it's still, are you a type 2 diabetic? Type 1 insulin. You could be type 2 and on insulin. Were you diagnosed as a child? or no, no, recently. Recently. And so your pancreas can still be pumping out some, and then you're taking insulin, you're still creating a situation of hyperinsulinemia because it's not perfectly met. My type 2 diabetics that are on insulin have lowered their insulin usage and some off of it completely. I have type 1 diabetics that are juvenile diabetics. I have one girl that's 18 years of age came to see me. She has the Medtronic pump. Her basal rate 17. She was jacking herself with 82 units of insulin a day. That's a lot. After eight weeks, her A1C had dropped by one point, her basal rate was down to 12, and she was using a total of 30, between 30 and 32 units a day. Why? Because I said to her, no, you don't have dessert every night. You don't have diet soda. Uh-uh. Your mouth is not supposed to have a party at every meal. When she went through all these changes and everything else, the fact that she had been on so much insulin for so long, you know, the doctors were like, how is this possible? It's easy when you take in the right fuel. When you figure out 
what you're supposed to be taking in. You know, you don't pour a milkshake in a gas tank in a car. And so that is, you know, like drinking acid. So especially if you're on insulin, you have to be vigilant and, and watch because your need for insulin is going to be a lot less. You never want to put yourself in a truly hypoglycemic state by taking too much insulin and you changed your diet and you really bottom out, you know? So you have, that's why it's so important with the partnership. And can you please say again about the diet pop? What is that? What's going on? People think this. There's no sugar and that's a good drink. I guess like your body. I'm sorry? It's like toxin. Uh -huh. And your body reacts to it just like as if it is. Uh -huh. If it tastes sweet to you, it's sweet. Even if it's like a Diet Coke caffeine free. I have so many people tell me, no, there's no sugar in this. <clears throat> it's artificial sugar. Right. And it still affects your body. See. Mm -hmm. Does it cause insulin to increase? In the majority of my clients, yeah. Wow. And they've been surprised. The other is just nothing. I mean, they're with toxins. I think the healthiest thing, you know, you're drinking water or you go to some place like Trader Joe's and get those jugs of unsweetened uh, iced tea. Uh -huh. They have a mint flavored and whatever. You drink that. That's the best thing for your kidneys and everything else. Yes? Yeah. Now, what comes first? My husband diagnosed first with diabetes. Uh -huh. Then they found that he had uh, pancreatic cancer. Okay. So did the did the cancer create the diabetes or the diabetes create the cancer? And how do you deal with the cancer? Well, you know, that's actually we're working on a grant right now with a physician at Northwestern to implement the PNP pancreatic nutritional program with pancreatic cancer patients because would it be, would the body, would the pancreas be able to handle the treatment more effectively if it's not being called into action so often with the wrong food? You know, your body has voices and you have to listen to those voices. You know, when, when someone's diagnosed with diabetes, let's say, just that's the body talking to you and it's reacting to what you're eating and it's unhealthy. You know, when I say to my clients, you know, and in the book it says, you get in front of a mirror, take off all your clothes and you look. You get on the scale or you test your blood. The body is speaking to you. It's saying, give me something to work with. And people ignore the voices of the body. Diabetes is a wake-up call. Pancreatic cancer is a wake-up call that you are stressing your body to the max. And if all of these studies are showing that cancer is fueled, cancer has a sweet tooth, okay? And it is fueled by glucose. How is glucose getting into the body? It's because you're putting something in your mouth. So we talk about mind, body, spirit. Why should the mind, one against two, make decisions that poison two, the body, and the poor spirit that has to live within this body, that your choices, poor choices, are putting it in a very, uh, you know, precarious state. So, um, but again, I, I, you know, when I hear, you know, uh, clients come to me and say, oh, well, I'm on five medication and whatever, and my doctor, and, and I will say to them, well, what are you doing for yourself? What do you mean? What am I supposed to do for myself? There's a lot you can do for yourself. Have any other questions? Or? Okay, you said you have some ge general guidelines, you know, for pancreatic health. Like in your book, do you elaborate on those, or do you, with, or do you feel that the glucose testing is? Because my husband would not. I don't think he'd do the glucose testing. But well, I, you don't have to. I mean, just like you said, those, if you make those few changes, right. that is going to have a significant impact mm -hmm. on your health and well-being. You know, clients will say to me, oh, does this mean I can never drink or whatever? Well, you know, you can go to a restaurant, you can have a glass of wine, you can have a beer, but if you're going to have 
a second glass of wine, you need to follow that first glass of wine with a full glass of water or a full glass of unsweetened iced tea because it dilutes the sugar content. It's just, you know, when you want to flush things out. So you can still enjoy life. You can still, you know, have different things. You just need to know what your body can and cannot handle. It's like helping your kidneys get rid of it by get, taking the water. Everything. everything. Too much animal protein, actually, when you bring up kidneys, is toxic to the kidneys. They can only handle so much. You know, you're, you're, if you think about it, I mean, you know, each one of us is different. If you even think for the next five minutes on what you've done in a given day and how you have not honored your body, how you really haven't protected your body, you know, forget the pancreas for a minute, but your whole body, you know, each night or even in the morning when you get up, you should really think, you know, like, what am I going to do for myself today? How am I going to keep myself healthy? What can I do to improve my health? I, 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 the rewards are tremendous. And I think that if there's an opportunity of extending a remission, reversing an illness or whatever, just by what you eat. You know, as a nurse, you know, working with, you know, a, a person that was uh, injured in a ski accident is a paraplegic. There's nothing that they can do by eating that's going to change that situation. But when clients come to me who have renal disease, they're diabetic, they've got heart disease, they're uh, overweight or whatever, and I say, just by changing what you eat, you can reverse your health, it's a no-brainer. If somebody told me I had to eat shoe leather in order to reverse, I would do it. So, if, do you believe that what, what's, you're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and you change and you follow your program, obviously it's, it's, a, it's beneficial to your pancreas, like you said, so you're not overworking it, but do you believe that it actually could, well could is, you know, that's pretty subjective because everybody is different, help that person live longer or have, help that person not uh, have the cancer come back sooner or than later? Or I don't know, that's you, why we're going to do the study, yeah. but if we go by the research that's already been done mm -hmm. that was started in 1923, where we talk about cancer cells having a sweet tooth, think about it. Even if, I mean, any of us that have not been diagnosed with cancer can have a malignant cell in our body. So do you want to create a Petri dish for that? If you know that glucose fuels a cancer cell, I certainly don't want to grow one if I have a slight malignant cell. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. I think that any time you shut off the fuel source, you're better off. And then, of course, your entire body is not going to be inflamed. You know, if we put aside the pancreas, let's talk about your blood vessels. Let's talk about your kidneys with that glucose and that insulin going like this. And then, Candice, in your book, do you talk about diet? Like, for example, have beans one night with, with tomatoes and blood? I have suggestions, and I also have a day in the life of the pancreatic nutritional program which says you get up in the morning, you, you do some cleansing breaths, you know, what you do on a given day and how you start out and sample, uh, you know, meals of what you would eat or try. Mm -hmm. And then the journal of, it's important to journal, you need to look back and reflect and to see you know, the other thing is stress is um, adds to, you know, poor health. Anytime you're in a stressful situation, you're causing your adrenal glands, you know, with adrenaline and cortisol. And when those flood your system, those stop, it stops insulin from being effective. Insulin will not open up the cell to allow it in the cell. It keeps it in the bloodstream because it figures you need it for flight or fight. And so, again, you're creating a toxic environment. So, it, you know, you have to um, uh, tune in. 
tune into your body as far as stress about what you're feeding it. Um, it's a living organism, and I think too many of us take it for granted. Uh, good, strong message. I, I take it seriously. You're 8 to 12 weeks. What's your rationale behind that? It usually, most people are like starting out uh, kind of the first week they'll do their, the way they've been eating before and they'll test and they'll be like, oh my God, I can't believe it. You know, the numbers are higher or whatever. And then they start to slowly plug into the PNP and then they start having results. Um, their weight starts to change. Uh, they're feeling better. They're sleeping better. Uh, and then um, I always ask, because everything is, you know, in the, on the front of the book it says data driven. I keep very uh, religious um, tracking of my uh, clients. So I have blood work when they first come to me and then blood work at 12 weeks to see the difference. Cholesterol, you know, young girls with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, I see a difference in their follicle stimulating hormones, their luteinizing hormones, their testosterone level. The other thing is, is insulin also, when you raise your insulin levels, you've got too much insulin, it has a direct effect on the production of testosterone. So all this with men with low T, they talk about, that's a direct result of pancreatic abuse because insulin suppresses the production of testosterone in men. And it does the same thing with women with their ovaries. It suppresses the production of estrogen by the ovaries. So you'll see young girls that um, have some facial hair. They might even be losing some of their hair on top. You'll see hair on their arms. They get acne, whatever. That is because there is a suppression of estrogen being manufactured by the ovaries and a rise in the testosterone in their bodies. And so you'll see that with men. There's a suppression of testosterone and a rise because men and women both have testosterone and estrogen in their bodies. So that's why we call the, refer to the pancreas as the, the gatekeeper. How do you feel about fish? Fish? I think it's wonderful. I do. But fish that is wild caught is better than a lot of the farm raised. You have to be very careful with farm raised because a lot of the farm raised fish are being fed corn. So, you know, what, what, why would, you know, so you're not getting the nutritional benefits that you would from wild caught. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.